This is the first of uh, many public meetings that will happen around the concept of what I've started to call uh, Uptown 2.0. Uh, we have, uh, we're 15 years into a comprehensive plan of Uptown. A lot of uh, successful things have happened. Uh, we've had a, a couple of sticking points, and we, as a council, had decided to come back, uh, revisit this plan, uh, stick some tentacles out into the community, and, and look at some areas we didn't look at it the first time. Um, and this will be a, a, a long, ongoing process. It'll probably finish up next summer. Uh, there's going to be plenty of opportunity to uh, have input into this plan. We do want community input into this plan. We want to know what you like um, about Uptown now and what you think we may have missed on. I think Doug's going to go into greater detail on that, but um, it's going to be your night here tonight to, to react, and there's going to be many other opportunities to do so. So I'll turn it over to Doug Farr. Thanks, Mayor. Good evening. How are we doing? Good. All right. It's great turnout. Thank you for giving us your evening, two hours of your evening. So we have, um, we're all, first of all, honored to be here and working back again in normal. Um, incredibly proud every time we come down and see what Uptown has become. And I think it's a real asset to the community. Anyone disagree so far? Okay, it's an asset to the community. It's great, it's terrific. People, we show it um, around the country, and in fact in other countries, and everyone is agog. Everyone wants it. How did you do that? What's the miracle of that place? And so um, it's really an honor to touch it a second time. Um, very little of the plans that we do are work that we do alone. So we have assembled a great team that I actually wanna introduce to you, and disregard the council members' names. These are not council members, but we've asked, we were encouraged to seat our team up there because there's a good point of view and they're mic mic so they can answer your questions if you have any. Um, but anyway, maybe I'll, we'll test the microphones and have each person introduce yourself. Is there a uh, My name is Bob Gibbs. From, I'm based out of Detroit. I'm the retail advisor. Uh, Mark De Laverne with Sam Schwartz Engineering. We'll be working on the transportation and parking portion of the project. I'm Stacy Meekins, also with Sam Schwartz Engineering. I'm Kyle Vangel with HRNA Advisors out of New York, and we're advising on office opportunities and also larger economic development strategies. I'm Kumar Kintala from HRNA as well. There you go. Ah, thank you. I'm Todd Zimmerman, and I am not very adept at making microphones work. Uh, we're <laughs> I'm here to help out with the housing component. Steve Wilson with Bar Associates, uh, project manager. Karishma Lee with Bar Associates, urban designer. Perfect. So there probably isn't enough time to ask each of you to introduce yourself, so maybe we can start by asking some sort of general questions. Who here works in the, down, in the uptown downtown area? Who lives in Uptown, downtown? Uptown. A couple people. Um, who goes to school hereabouts? Any ISU students? A couple, are you here for credit? Because, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, it's pass-fail tonight. You really, the pressure's off, no, no exams. Um, let's see, who was around 15 years ago when we did the first plan? Wow, that's incredible. Thank you for coming back. What other categories should we recognize? Who are elected officials? So the mayor introduced himself. We've got some council members and some library board members. Um, uh, we had a briefing last night with the library board, and thank you all for coming out. Um, who else? How about plan commission or other? OK, great. Um, what am I missing? Somebody call it out. What are we missing? Property owners? Uh, one, business owners? Okay, um, let's see. I think that pretty well covers it. If you, if there, if there's a category or an individual that I failed to recognize, you have my permission to raise your hand and say, "What about the blank?" So, any of those? If not, we'll move on. So, let's see. <clears throat> so we're gonna get you out on the street at 8:30. The agenda doesn't say that, but that's the plan. Um, so we've just done our welcome and introductions. Um, 
What I want to do is just, in plain English, tell you what we think we're here to do. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Uptown Plan was done in 1999, really at the tail end of the 20th century. It was a long time ago by, by all sorts of measures. The plan has been amazingly executed. At least half of the plan we drew and planned has been built. And I'll just tell you that's rare. So we're based in Chicago. There's a really famous Chicago plan, the Burnham Plan, which was done in 1909. After 105 years, it is said to be somewhere between 25 and 30 percent complete. So, so give yourself a big pat on the back to be half done in 15 years. That's really remarkable. So uh, the council and, and, the, and the mayor and, and Mark and the staff asked us to do basically two different things. One is give ourselves, take a pa moment of pause and look back at the plan figure out the goals and objectives we set out. Did we accomplish them? Did we do that well? Did we somehow stray from the course and do something different? So that kind of circumspection, right? Second thing is pause. Give ourselves a report card. Is, it, is everything as good as it could be? Are there tweaks we need to do to the plan to complete the plan, right? Adjustments to, to make. Um, a lot of time has passed. The world has turned. 9-11 happened. The internet wasn't invented, but has really become a dominant force in our lives. Smartphones happen. Lots of things have happened in those 15 years. So what about changes in society cause us to want to update the plan as well? So that's sort of the first half of the project. As the alluded to, the second part of it is to cast a much wider area, look, look at a bigger study area than we did the first time. And so we're going to do that. That includes south of the tracks. That includes, you know, we've got some maps I'll show you in a minute where that covers. But um, in a real estate sense, and you, you heard our uh, consultants introduce themselves, retail experts, transportation experts, office experts, housing experts. When we did the first plan, there was no uptown normal. You know, it was that little crossroads of that weird three-way intersection that was always awkward and you were having, couldn't tell if I was supposed to go next or the other guy was supposed to go next. It was a funny little thing. There's now a destination. It's one of the strongest branded places. Ask anybody you've ever been, you only need, it's like Oprah, Cher, Bono, Uptown. You don't even need to know what city or, or state you're in. Uptown is something that people recognize, right? That's incredible. You, a lot of real estate developers would kill for that. We have that, right? So because we now have a destination, the things that it can support, the things that, are, that it can influence are much greater. So that's really why we've got this A team <coughs> to study that. Does it make sense? We good? Any questions so far? Cool. All right. If you have any, just wave your hand. We can be informal. So um, are the slides visible with the lights on, or should we? Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, so here is um, pointer. Whoops. What did I do? Oh, I, oh, there it is. Middle button. Okay. Cool. Yeah, whatever. Um, on that board is a red dash line. And if you can see it, if you can see the red dash line, you have good eyesight. Okay. So here it is in inversion. So you can see we've we've drawn a bigger line down to Vernon, out a couple blocks, what, a block or two east of Linden, um, north of Willow, and then out to Main Street. Obviously, we aren't doing a master plan for ISU, <coughs> but its, it's influence is powerful. I want to think about that. So um, enough said. Here's a bit more focus uh, uh, in the, you know, uh, south, particularly south, south, of, uh, south of the tracks and uh, a focus on the study area there. So um, that's what we're doing. Here's a schedule. Um, and these uh, don't tell you what year, but I think we can kind of fill in <coughs> which year they are. So this is the kickoff. We did a workshop last time 15 years ago. Uh, the name we gave it was a charrette, which is a multi-day workshop where we actually all draw together. We work around small tables. We critique. We pin it up. We do it again. Uh, to get it a good plan. So that'll happen in late January, early February. Um, March, we'll come back and have a workshop focused exclusively on sustainability. 
Um, one thing you may not know about Uptown Normal, but again, another distinction that it, that it carries is that it was certified as a lead neighborhood development in, what year was that, Mercy? 2007, 8, something like that. It's one of 100 places in the country that have that, so it's pretty rare. So again, it's part of the town's great legacy and investment, so we think we need to look at that again. So we'll do that in March. Um, we hope to present the draft plan, which doesn't exist. Anyone who thinks we showed up and they already know what they want to do and this is a cooked process and any of that sort of stuff, trust me, we have no idea. We really don't. So and you'll, wh when we start speaking, you'll really know that to be true. So, uh, but we'll, we've got the right team. We'll get that done. And then in June, an open house, present to council, uh, and then a new plan will be established, adopted, and hopefully they're, thereafter implemented. So any questions on that? <clears throat> so you may remember this crude pencil drawing that proved to be pretty darn good. This was the cartoon sketch that we did to communicate what Uptown Normal might look like. This drawing was done in 1999. Obviously, only about half of it is built. There's two and a half buildings complete and uh, two and a half buildings yet to do uh, that sort of comprise the five buildings around the square. But a lot of things that, um, that are outside just the circle have been completed. The hotel is amazing. Buford Street is looking really good uh, and lots of other improvements. A lot of parking decks and investment in that regard. Uh, but this, this generating vision drawing really carried the day to communicate to people what it was we were after, 1999. Here was the plan in the day. Um, the plan wasn't actually built as planned exactly. It was a living document, meaning as uh, opportunities came up or adjustments that made sense presented themselves, the plan was modified and altered slightly. Um, a big change from the original plan, if you remember back in 1999, you could actually walk across the tracks just at grade. There wasn't any fences or anything like that. Um, and over in, again, one of the many things that has changed since then, from then to now, was perceptions of safety on the railroad's part. So, they're freaked out about people being on the tracks as pedestrians. They're freaked out about someone passing the first train only to have a second train coming that they didn't see. So anyway, they've really clamped down on that pedestrian crossing. So that's a big deal for us because it really cuts off and isolates the stuff south of the track. So we'll be taking a really close look at that. Zeroing in on the, you know, just a focused in um, uh, part of the plan, you can see that um, we did a retail sort of analysis and segmentation. Um, to the premise was closer to campus, the retail is more campus oriented, closer to the circle, more mixed, closer to Linden, much more destination retail, not for students, but for um, folks in the community at large. <clears throat> Here was a sketch just of, of the moment of what the fountain, the plaza would look like. It envisioned dancing waters up in the air. <laughs> that particular version didn't happen, but the idea that the, f the fountain and the plaza would capture stormwater and filter it to the delight of all of us is one thing it did fulfill, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, a detailed uh, focus in on the, the um, circle and the uh, design guidelines that we finished in 2002 that established the system of arcades and the circle and the idea that there would be a continuous circular path that you could walk around the outside um, and then uh, the roundabout and the plaza inside that. These uh, regulating design guidelines uh, coached us that when we built a building, we could add a taller, sort of a tower element um, in a way that terminated a street. So when you look down a street, straight ahead there'd be like a church steeple used to do or a train station, kind of a vertical piece. Um, the best example I think that's built is the clock tower on this building. So it really terminates Constitution Trail, it's a, in a really prominent location. And that kind of uh, coaching is called urban design. Okay. Here's what um, uh, Uptown looked like in 2003. Um, and you can see there's, it, it's a pretty bleak view. It's not, not that Uptown was bleak, but these views uh, I think are just a little gray. 2009, the circle has happened, um, but not a lot else. Everything was historic, was retained. Um, and then here we go, 2013, uh, City Hall, uh, the Council Chambers. Ooh. Yeah, okay, thank you, Mark. 
Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's happening. <clears throat> so the, the hotel, the parking lot, and so on. So we've really made a lot of progress, but there's a lot of work yet to do. Those two sites, and obviously the, the uh, hotel coming out of the ground uh, is next. So um, same perspective, different view. Oh, before and after, yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we called it something different at six o'clock, so I thank you, Steve, for, for clarifying. So Mercy and others compiled some before and after pictures of Uptown, and this is just to kind of uh, illustrate for us the dramatic change that's happened. So I think they speak for themselves. I'll just uh, click through them. That was the before, this is the after. Four. Yeah, who, is that couple in the audience tonight? <laughs> no? After. Before. After. Before. After. Okay, that's kind of fun. We can do it again if you want. We can do it at the end. Do it all night. We'll, a few more? Okay. After this, okay. Rendering and real building. These are all lead buildings, eh? Cool. Okay, the circle. Land view. And the, the collection of awards that the Circle and the Uptown have won are just amazing. So um, I, I love to talk about that stuff. So, so what's next? Here we go. So is there a thing after this? This is it, right? Oh, OK, cool. Thank you. Um, so the next part. We've called on our experts to each give a little coaching on the trends that are in place nowadays that govern the work we're about to do. And I think, am I first? I am first, okay. Trends in urban design. So, um, so this is meant to be conversational. It's not super science-y, um, but let's show you what we've got. So one of the things, one of the projects that's underway in town is the design of this, um, a way to get across the tracks, given that the railroads don't want us to do it just by walking across anymore. To orient, to orient you, this is the city hall. There's the clock. And so this is a current design for a stair and elevator uh, structure that would get you up, over, and down uh, across to the other side of the tracks and currently proposes connecting to the back side of the current or the now old Amtrak station as a kind of waiting room on the north side of the tracks. So what we see when we see this is certainly a facility that gets people across the tracks, but would be something you would do either <coughs> reluctantly or only if you had to. It's not fun, it's not delightful, it's not inducing. So um, one, of, one of the things that we hope to do are to bring forward illustrations and ideas that might get us thinking differently. So I'm about to show you a bunch of slides and please don't go home and say, oh, that guy is so crazy. He said we could do X, Y, and Z. These are ideas, right? So have people heard of the High Line in New York? Have people visited the High Line in New York? So it's um, in one, some people think of this as the silliest, folliest thing ever done. The most expensive way to spend money in the air, I think was what I heard from Todd earlier today. Um, but given that what we have here is you're up in the air at the second level, how could we make that a virtue? Or is it a virtue? Or is there another way to think about getting across the tracks with the High Line? It's a couple miles long, it's in Manhattan, and all kinds of crazy people from Manhattan and around the world walk the length of it, delighted to be looking down at things below them, including this sort of bleacher situation where what are they looking down on? A street. So it's the cars going underneath, just regular everyday street. Pretty cool. You know, could our bridge be this kind of thing looking at the trains, right? Would that make it fun? Would that make it interesting? So uh, just, just a thought. And here's 
um, you know, the idea that it's not simply a, 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 a route to pass along, it is also a place that people choose to linger and spend time. That's, that's the highlight. This is a really, this comes from a really different place, but I want to show it to you. This is in Stockholm, Sweden. This is the culture house, or as they pronounce it there, Kulturhuset. And I show it here because it um, shows a sunken plaza. Again, you are entering kind of at the second level. So the kind of main floor of the building is up on, on either the, the second floor or you could say this is a sort of sunken plaza. This building stacks in one structure kind of a lot of uh, um, community uses, library, black box theater, it's got a transit center all in one. So it's a kind of one-stop destination that all age groups have a reason to go visit. So this came up, we showed this image last night to the library board as a kind of get the juices flowing, what, what partnerships could you do to make a cool library. The Salt Lake Public Library in Salt Lake City, Utah is uh, another kind of one of those transformational uh, buildings. It's not, uh, you know, a library with stacks all in a row. It's quite a dynamic, um, dramatic public space, winter garden, all those kinds of things. And on top of that, it also does a trick with a change of grade where this, this um, arcade deal allows you to walk up to the top of the roof from outside and then there's a terraced garden up on the roof of the building. So again, we're introducing ideas, none of which really apply exactly, but test these ideas of once you're in the air, how could you take advantage of that? What would be value added? Um, this is Chicago, the Lurie Garden, and for those of you who have seen it, the Nichols Bridge, which is a really long sort of shot that gets you up to actually to the third floor at the Art Institute. It is also an image of how a cultural institution, in this case a museum, faces a park. So those are interesting ideas I think we will hopefully uh, test. I also uh, hold, hold ourselves to a really high standard to say if we do our jobs right, the same way that Uptown might now almost be at this point, do people get wedding shots in the circle? Does that happen at all? It does. We'd like to do it again south of the tracks. We'd like to do it again a couple more times. So that is uh, urban designer bliss when you hear that people you know, hold, it, hold the place in high enough regard to do that. Uh, another trend I want to refer to is called tactical urbanism, which is taking public spaces that we, don't, we often take for granted, like streets, sometimes even parking spaces and things like that, and, and programming them differently. So you can re-envision how they work. This is obviously yoga in the street. Um, another trend is pop-up retail, this idea that you don't necessarily have to have a bricks and mortar store. These are container boxes like you'd see on the back of a semi or the back of a, a flat, uh, flat car um, that have been made into shops. And I think this is maybe in London, but you know, is there some idea there that we might introduce in Uptown? Um, and then this is just an image to remind us that we want to look at sustainability again. Um, Part of our team is uh, this group, the Living Futures Institute, um, and they'll, that's the March workshop we're going to do with them. And so uh, we can answer questions about that later, but that's, those are my trends. Who's next? Steve. Housing. Todd Zimmerman. Any questions so far? Oh, yeah. Question? I don't know, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, what I would say is, yeah, that's, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's what I would say. One of the things that we have found in our practice that makes sense for municipal clients is when you invest in something, it better do more than one thing for you, right? Right? So that bridge, all it does is gets people up, over, and down. It depresses real estate values south of the tracks we will come up with, like the High Line connects everything along its entire two miles has gone up in value, right? That crossover, for example, doesn't do that. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, it's not like I'm picking on the bridge, but I'm just saying part of our job is to say, is there a way maybe to do the bridge that allows it to expand later? 
or has a, you know, an interesting overlook or, you know, whatever. It's being thoughtful. But I appreciate your question. Well, the, the bridge that's being built, I think, is all IDOT funded. Is that right? So there's no tax dollars, to my understanding, paying for it. Is that right? Somebody just nod. Somebody in position of authority nod. Yes. Yes. But if it... So all tax, gentleman says all tax dollars, right? So IDOT is funding that. Safety improvement, right? With a minimum, I would say a minimum benefit. D Doug, I, Doug, I, I can just make a quick point from back here about this. I think, I think your question ex is exactly right. If you're going to spend money, you better get a return on your investment. And so the idea is if th we all hold ourselves to is that the ideas for public space or development that we propose in this master plan in conjunction with the community, we're going to want to make sure that it's going to result in private investment incurring because of that. <coughs> So if it helps make normal more competitive for businesses or more competitive to attracting new talent to come live in normal, that's the kind of goals that we have in mind for this master plan. Was there an, another? Yep. But role in evaluation of infrastructure, like electricity and Can I propose that we write that one down? Because that's like an hour. <laughs> and I'd love to talk to you about it you know, tonight or in the future. But I feel like just for time, we probably can't go there. Was there a quick comment or? Yeah. Well, the, the bridge is IDOT. Bridge is IDOT funded. And IDOT is a state of Illinois agency, and they get revenue from federal grants and state sources, so federal and state sources, so it's probably taxes, yeah. Yes, we have nothing to do with the bridge. It's already, the money's been, you know, devoted to the project. We're just saying it could be designed better, yeah, right? I think we've probably, cover that one. So, Todd? Hi. I uh, brought some pictures to share with you. Everybody remember this? I'm going to talk about households rather than housing because I only have a few minutes. When we talk about the American household, still, for many of us, this is an image that we have in our, in our head. Ozzy went off to work, whatever he did. Harriet stayed home with two kids, single family house in the suburbs. That, um, the, the latest version of that is, is this. Um, and that relatively rare creature in America, a white baby. Um, a, a family that in, uh, 19, in the 1950s was 65% of all households. So that when we said American household and conjured up that family, we were right. And for someone my age, it kind of sticks with you. And I have a sense a lot of you out there are my age. Um, that group now is only 22% of American households. And when you go back to Ozzie and Harriet, where Harriet stayed home, the single earner, the, the very most traditional household that was the norm when I was growing up, a pitiful minority, 11%, hardly worth focusing on. Baby boomers, my generation, I was the first baby boomer, by the way, and I, I, uh, my mother told me I was born nine months and 20 minutes after the Japanese surrendered. Um, <laughs> you are listening. 
that we have changed America. Our generation has changed America. Uh, but whether it's inexorably or not, whether this is the long amnesia that we created with our McMansions and our SUVs and our cul-de-sacs and places where all the grass grows perfectly in the same direction. These people now, uh, there's a significant percentage who are abandoning those houses because after all the kids are gone, the dogs died, so uh, the lawn's too big to mow, um, too small to farm. <coughs> um, they're moving back into uh, close-in neighborhoods, sometimes in very urban neighborhoods. And depending on their personal disposition, they're moving to uh, great urban centers like uh, New York and Chicago and San Francisco. And some of them are moving to tiny little urban centers uh, like uh, potentially uptown. It's a possibility. could happen. But the group that we need to think about now are the millennials. In 2010, they passed the boomers as the largest generation in American history. Um, and this is the perfect image of millennials. It's a woman empowered on a bicycle with her ball and chain pinioned across the rear wheel. <laughs> the, this century is going to be made by millennial women. There are 60 percent of, of, uh, of college of undergraduates nationally. Um, I think it's 59 percent of, uh, of masters. Uh, they're projected to be more than half of employment growth over the next, uh, next 10 years. Uh, they, and they ride bicycles in high heels. <laughs> Bicycling. That, now, I, we, we talk to millennials all the time because we're, we focus only on urban places or walkable communities. So we have to understand who's going to live there. We've spent, we've spent our whole lives talking to baby boomers because we are baby boomers. Millennials, much more mysterious. Much more mysterious. There's a, there's a subset of millennials who are extremely angry about how they were brought up in the suburbs, where it was a rite of passage to, to leave their cul-de-sac, where until they were, depending on what state you lived in, 16 or 17, you were hostage to someone with a driver's license to do anything. And in the worst case, if you were not the oldest child, that person with a driver's license was an older sibling. It's like a, a perfect storm of horror. Um, so there's a percentage of them that are, that are quite upset about that upbringing and swear now, pre-marriage, pre-child, that they would never inflict a child of theirs on that kind of upbringing. This is the big question because famously, millennials are moving to urban, walkable places of every scale. Again, that same <coughs> spectrum as the, as, the, uh, as the baby boomers, some who would if it's not Brooklyn or Portland, it's not worth thinking about living. And there are others who, I'm sorry, I could never live in Brooklyn. Um, but every scale from towns, from suburban centers that are becoming urbanized to <coughs> second, third, fourth tier cities and, and small towns. They don't drive. They don't like to drive. Not only do they are, is Detroit concerned and, and, the, and Japan and other great auto centers concerned about their car purchasing, they don't even have light driver's licenses as, as uh, predecessor generations do. The percentage of, of driver's licenses held by persons under 19 is only 4%. And 30 years ago, it was twice that when there were fewer eligible uh, people of that age. Bicycling, on the other hand, uh, bicycle commuting since 1990 has increased 37%. Um, um, in bike-friendly communities, which I understand you were just designated today, um, <laughs> congratulations, it's important, 90, 97%. Not 37% increase, 97% increase. So the stuff that you're doing to make your community bike friendly is paying <coughs> off. 
It's and and for for the the folks who don't like cyclists and don't like bicycling, you benefit too because there's more room on the road because those people on the bikes would have been in cars. I, t I can't talk about housing without showing some housing, so here's a token housing uh, picture. Uh, this is a loft. Uh, lofts have become uh, one of the, the great housing products of the beginning couple decades of this century. And uh, they're, in some markets, they ran out of uh, sp uh, space that was non-residential to convert to, to residential, so they build lofts uh, fresh. D Dallas is a, is a great example, but it's happening uh, all over. What I didn't show a picture of are micro lofts that can be as small as 200 or 250 square feet. Um, you will, I doubt, ever have that problem that the micro law fills in normal. But there are cities where, in order to get places for young professionals to live at the, at the rent range that they can afford to pay, a micro loft is the only way to make the numbers work. So th this just sort of surfs across the household trends that give rise to housing trends uh, in America. Uh, how this applies to the normal, I don't know yet, but I uh, check back in uh, late January or early February. Who's next? Good evening, my name is Bob Gibbs. I'm the retail advisor, and uh, my sector retailing has greatly changed. Uh, that's a constant, we change all the time. We follow what consumers want. And right now, our consumers are telling us that they want a lot for a low price. So we're getting flooded in the United States with these super discount stores, mostly foreign, like Uniqlo, Uniqlo is from Japan, H&M is from Scandinavia. You can see that's a $12 dress on the upper left. And these retailers are serving the needs of the millennials that are not earning as much as their parents and that want a good design for a good price. The newest trend for retail developers and stores is to locate in cities. And as quickly as possible, the leading national retailers like Crate and Barrel, Forever 21, even Walmart, uh, they're building urban stores in downtowns and cities because that's where the shoppers are. That's where the baby boomers are moving to. That's where the millennials are moving to. And they're completely reinventing their model. They're making smaller stores, they're making stores that are two and three and four levels high and they're getting away from the standardized suburban model that they followed for 50 or 60 years. <coughs> the shopping center developers, when they can't find a city to go to, are making new fake cities. And they're called lifestyle centers. And they're building these out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, this is one that's in a, in a ring city of Washington, D.C. And they build main streets, and they build retail with housing above. They're always putting libraries in them. The new thing is to make sure you put your library in your town center because a good library brings 1,000 people a day through its doors and every retailer wants to be by that young family that's going to the library. So everybody is putting libraries in their downtown. They're putting city halls in the downtown, police stations, all the civic uses they can. And the advantage of this is that it's a terrific real estate play. The retail makes the housing more valuable. And the housing makes the retail more valuable. And uh, both of those combined make it a place where employers want to open offices. Because office workers today don't want to be out in a suburban office park where they have to get in their car and drive to Wendy's. They actually want to be in an urban environment where they can go down the elevator, go out the front door, and choose from 30 or 40 restaurants and a Starbucks. That's what it takes to attract the, the high talent today. 
Um, nationally, about 30, today, about 37% of retail uh, are power centers, about 31% are regional malls like your Eastland Mall. Power centers are what you have along Veterans Parkway. About 9% are internet, 7% are lifestyle centers, only 2% are downtowns. In the 1940s and 50s, downtowns captured about 60% of the market share. We've had this tremendous shrinkage, and it's forecast that downtowns will capture about 20, return back to about 20 to 25%. One of the challenges that I would leave you with as a community is to decide how much market share would you like to capture in your uptown area. You probably have less than 1% right now. You probably have 1% or 1%. Our job will be to do mar a market study to see what you're capturing in terms of market share, in terms of sales. Uh, but it would be nice for you to, to decide as a community uh, where you'd like that to be. Would you like, are you happy with 1% of the market share, 2%, 5%, 10%? What kind of goal would you like to have for the next couple of decades? Uh, malls are not dead. And despite all that's been written about uh, shopping malls and closed malls, saying that the mall is dead, that's just simply not true. There have been about 20 to 25% of the enclosed malls have died, and they've been raised, or they're, they're about to be torn down. But those have always been in very weak markets where any product type would have failed. For the most part, the enclosed mall uh, is thriving, and for the most part, they are overperforming or doing better than uh, downtowns or lifestyle centers. I don't know if that's going to change, but right now they're doing very well, especially the super luxury malls. The malls that have the Louis Vuitton and the really high-end retailers are doing very well. On average, the US average uh, shopping mall in the United States generates about $275 in sales per square foot per year. Everything in my industry is rated on sales per square foot per year of the center. I met with a handful of retailers today in the uptown area and based on what they're quoting me in <coughs> rents, rents are 10% of sales we're estimating that they're probably doing sales of below $100 a square foot per year. The national average for independent retailers is about $80 a square foot per year. And probably the uptown retailers are slightly better than the national average. The highest grossing shopping center developer in the country, the Taubman Company, has sales of almost $700 a square foot per year. We work with some shopping centers that have sales of over $1,000 a square foot per year. This is a map that shows where 80%, uh, well, 80 percent of the U.S. population today lives in urban areas. And the blue counties represent where 50 percent of U.S. residents live. And when Uniqlo or H&M or when a new retailer decides to open stores in the U.S., they first gravitate to those blue counties. And of course, this county is not one of those blue counties. But after they deploy stores, then they'll go to the additional counties. This is what we're seeing happening in a lot of cities. This is uh, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, where we did a similar study about the same time we did this original study 15 years ago. And this is what they built. They built a mixed use uh, center with housing on top of retail. This is what. Uh, at the time was very unconventional, at the time was considered way out there. Today this is the new norm, and this is what retailers and uh, residential and office developers are preferring to do. Uh, this is the shopper of today. Uh, she tends to be about 25 to 35 years old, and she tends to be a, a single parent, or she's living in a two-income family, She's working a long, day, a long day, and she tends to do all of her shopping at night. Last year, 75% of all retail sales occurred after 5.30 at night, because your boss doesn't give you time off anymore to go shopping. That just doesn't occur. And like Ozzie and Harriet, uh, Harriet didn't work 
so she could shop during the day. Uh, the uptown retailers we met with today, except for one, close at 6 o'clock at night. And uh, that's common. Uh, that's very common because when you're a small independent retailer, it's almost impossible to have evening hours. But your uptown area is likely giving up about 70% of the market share by closing at night. The other challenge that retailers have is that only 4% of the average family paycheck goes to shopping for apparel and only 5% goes to dining out. 91% of the average paycheck is spent before it's received. Every week you pre-spend 91% of your paycheck on your housing, on your insurance, on food, transportation, and other items. So when fuel prices go up or when you don't get overtime or when any, any number of things occur, people stop shopping. It's an elective activity. I recently saw a survey that said uh, the average household could go four years without buying any more clothing. And that's frankly what happens. And having a competitive shopping district or a competitive shopping center is very challenging because people can put it off. They can just say, I'm not going to shop today. I'm not going to shop tomorrow. If somebody decides to come, say, from the country club district, and they decide to come to Uptown to shop, and they get in their car and they come here and they can't find a place to park close to the store, they're going to not likely go around the block four or five times looking for a place to park. They're likely to say, I'll come back tomorrow, which they never do. And I think uh, one of the things we're going to look at is your parking. And I know you've examined parking a lot, but parking is one of those greatly misunderstood but important elements that determines whether or not you have sales. Many shoppers today want to see the front door of the store from their car in a downtown like this. And if they can't see the front door, they're going to consider, they're going to consider your parking to be very, very uh, inconvenient. This is what Walmart and Target are doing right now. They're opening downtown stores. The upper left is the new Walmart that just opened in downtown Washington, DC. And they built the Walmart store they attached it, the glass part, they attached it to a historic building with lofts in it. And Walmart and Target and Kohl's and H&M and all of the large retailers now are going urban. They like to be in downtowns. So that's where the customers are. You won't see very many four-story Walmart stores out in the suburbs, but that's what they're doing in cities. And it's just a matter of time before those types of retailers, and I'm not saying Walmart will come to uptown, but it's just a matter of time before a lot of very strong retailers uh, will be looking at this market. Uh, retailers like downtowns because it's easy to, it's, it, if it's managed well, it can be easy to access. It can be easy to park because you can frequently park in front of the store on a downtown, on a street front. And uh, the downtowns often, when they're well managed, have a, a nice tenant mix. book that I wrote called Urban Retail. I'll put a plug in for my book. Question? Sure. The, the retailers have invented something called the cartilator, and it's an escalator in which you can attach your shopping cart to it. Yeah, like, like, yeah. And then they, they, put the, they attach it to a parking garage because they know you won't cross the street. So they attach the, the store, the cash register areas to a, to a parking garage so you can go right into the garage at that level. Or, take a uh, cartilator up to your level.
That's a, that's a matter of some contention. We use 1977 to 1996, but there are others who will use different numbers, depending on the point they want to make. I define it as an, anyone younger than me, which is most of the people. Anybody else? Okay, thanks. Uh, so, uh, HRNA is just going to talk through some of our of our own experience and talk about how this illuminates some trends in the economic development space and in the office space. Um, first, Kumar is going to talk about Stores Connecticut and our experience, and then I'll, I'll talk about some of our experience in in uh, another place called Uptown Uptown Charlotte. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so we'll tell you two stories. One is about Stores, Connecticut, and it's uh, 85 miles from Boston, um, but much closer to Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, the unique thing about Stores that we thought was interesting for normal is that it's, um, it's the home for U University of Connecticut, UConn, which is about 22,000 students, very similar to Illinois State, which is 20 to 21,000. Um, it's, it's sort of a rural community. Um, uh, it's not a city. Uh, and there is the main campus, it's very compact, much like Illinois State is, it's a very, very compact university. What, um, what had happened though was that the university owned um, some property, called, uh, now called Store Center, but was essentially kind of just junky, low quality, industrial buildings and retail buildings. Um, and then they said, you know, we don't really need this property. Um, and the town said, well, you know, what we don't have, and, and UConn said, is we don't have a downtown environment. And so they did what, what, what normal did, and they created one. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive. It's a series of multi-story buildings with ground floor retail. There's a great circle, uh, circle like we have in normal um, that, that they created. And what's interesting to, to take away from this is they did this because they said, we are having difficulty attracting faculty, and they have a lot of graduate research um, students here, and graduate research students to come to the University of Connecticut because it's not an attractive place to live when they compare it to University of Pennsylvania. And so they, you know, the university put their might behind it, the town put their might behind it, and they went ahead and opened this first phase, which is about 200 units um, that it has, actually a mix of both students and faculty living there. Uh, so it's uh, a curated environment that attracts to both types of populations. Uh, the other lesson here is that they have, they have 200,000 square feet of retail that will be built as part of this project. So I think in sort of in line with what Bob was saying, there's a critical mass of space that really makes it a destination and allows a downtown to compete with a regional mall. Uh, so being competitive requires a little bit of critical mass. So I want to keep that in mind as well as we do this master planning process. Again, very similar to, to normal. There's a public space, a circle. There's lots of retail. There's a multimodal transportation center like we have downstairs. And there's residential. And it's become a vibrant place that's helped the, the town and the university become more competitive. And we think that's an important, an important goal for this master plan. Um, there's going to be a grocery store that's going to be built as part of a, a next phase here. And we want to explore that in normal as well. Uh, so I think uh, just a, some concluding thoughts about stores. They use land very strategically. And we think on the south of the tracks, there's going to be some opportunities to use land that is underutilized for special projects that, hate, that help the town become more competitive and the university more competitive. So we want to keep that in mind. Um, a second thing is that it, it, in making it more competitive has allowed them to not only uh, keep their campus as it is more competitive for faculty and staff, but they're building a large technology campus at UConn, not at Store Center, but away from Store Center at the, at the campus. And they, I, from what we hear, they feel like Store Center is a big selling point for them. And interesting, talking to some employers today, uh, Uptown Normal is a big selling point for, for their employees, but also they kind of the, when the executives from Japan come over from Mitsubishi, you know, they like the Uptown Normal. It's a special type of environment. And so um, as much as we can do to make Normal's businesses more competitive, 
through Uptown, uh, we want to examine things through those types of lenses. And I'll pass it over to Kyle to talk about how you use land strategically. So we also wanted to illustrate the trend of, as has been alluded to earlier, of employers and employees increasingly favoring downtown locations because they're more interesting. It's a fun place to spend their day. And this is illustrated through some work that we recently completed in Uptown Charlotte, where we helped the, the city and the county think through what to do with four key parcels of land that they had available. And much like in normal, the center of Uptown was largely complete. You know, the plan had been done and it had succeeded. And now, in the next decade, it was, what do we do with those outlying parcels surrounding the Uptown in a way to advance the goals of the community and attract the types of uses that they want, knowing that people are very interested in living, working, and playing in Uptown Charlotte. And the first step in this process is something we'll be beginning with you tonight as well, was understanding what are the goals for this site? Is it merely about selling the land for the, for the highest price and getting the most tax revenue, which is certainly a viable goal? Or is it also about you know, diversifying the economy and thinking about the, the types of specific jobs that we want to create, the types of property tax revenues that might become available, and, and finally, the types of uses that might just catalyze people to be downtown, to spend money and time downtown. Um, in, in, in our case, for instance, I want to illustrate what, what we did with the, the largest and most valuable of, of these sites, really recommended a program focused on destination uses that would be anchored in, in, an, in an office, a destination use that would be anchored by office, that would draw, you know, sort of, the trends we're hearing about the young millennial employees to Uptown Charlotte as a place to live, work, and play. And I think that this site, which was 14 acres, you know, sort of calls to mind that the City Hall Annex site, which is right across the tracks as we've been discussing, you know, if there's some kind of key uh, destination use, you know, that, that could really be a destination and get people to bridge over those tracks, want to cross those tracks, and at the same time serve economic development goals for the town of normal, be them to generate employment or to generate a new locus of activity, recreation. It's a really wonderful opportunity. And as Uptown Normal fills in, like Uptown Charlotte has filled in, uh, these, these kinds of parcels become very scarce. And you really have you know, kind of one shot to, to create something that is, that is uh, catalytic and transformative for the community. So in, in reflecting on our lessons, um, we just want to you know, highlight these because we think that you know, they were applicable in, in stores Connecticut, Charlotte, and in, in normal as well, uh, even though they're not necessarily being fully exploited here yet. Um, you know, employees want to increasingly be located in, in diverse urban environments, and as a result, employers want to locate there so that they're competitive for the best employees. Um, as initial waves of urbanization are, are finishing and being successful, it now becomes, what do we do with those next patches of underutilized land that a decade ago weren't the best sites, but today are some of the best sites that are left, and what can they do to be transformative for downtowns? And finally, it's about drawing on your unique assets and understanding strategically what, you know, kind of what are the holes in, in, in our economic development strategy, and and how can we leverage uptown land to solve that? And in stores, it was about creating a destination that would be attractive to new students and faculty, kind of a mixed use environment unlike anything that they had there. In Charlotte, it was about creating another catalytic job site and, and as well as cultural amenities on this very large parcel. And as we talk with you all tonight and get, uh, get started on this assignment, we look forward to understanding what the key uses that draw on Normal's existing assets could be uh, for, for the remaining uptown sites. So usually I start this off by asking how everybody got here, but it's freezing cold out, so I'm just very happy that everybody showed up. We don't even touch that part. Um, 
A, a lot of discussion has already been about transportation. Everybody here talking about it. And you know, the, the changes in transportation are changing a lot of the trends that have to do with everything else here, whether it's housing, retail, um, <coughs> or, or office and economic development. So um, I'm going to kind of go over a lot of this stuff very quickly. Um, you know, 56, we started building highways because there was a demand, you know, to, to really make more space for automobiles because people were uh, beginning to drive more. And this was the, this was the, the change in trend back then was car ownership. Um, we built a lot of highways, you know, interstates, interstates through cities, uh, a lot of room. We obviously needed room to put those cars in. We put in parking lots. We put in structure parking lots. We knocked down buildings in downtown to put surface parking lots. You know, we did a lot to, to respond to the demand that was happening. Um, <coughs> this is a, a very boring graph to show basically that average vehicle miles traveled continued to go up year by year by year, every single year. There were not, you know, even like little blips. Like we just kept going up and up and up. And there was no reason to think that that was going to stop because this is a trend that went on for a century. <coughs> but then something did happen. Um, you look in 2008 and the annual vehicle miles traveled began to flatten out. You know, that, that graph that was going up just stopped growing up. Obviously part of that because there was a recession and people were, were, were driving less. Um, but as the economy has started to pick back up, that graph hasn't gone anywhere. And then when you look at a per capita, you know, as we've added more people, uh, it, it's actually gone down um, because that, that VMT is staying flat, but we're having a lot more people out there. And <coughs> on a per capita basis, people are driving less. Um, you know, we look at economic development and, and you see where uh, <coughs> um, this is just showing where venture capital investment is going. Um, but, you know, it's, it's trending up where transit ridership is higher uh, and not where uh, people are driving more. Again, similarly, just more, more data, you know, showing that states that drive less have better economy. Um, and it's also <coughs> um, representative of the fact that Congestion at the same time. Congestion is a byproduct of success in a lot of places. Um, where, where no one likes congestion because everyone wants to get where they want to go as fast as they can. Um, but places that have congestion are often places that are very successful um, because that's where people want to go. <coughs> uh, we already talked about millennials are a large generation. My wife would be very upset to hear that I'm a millennial because we have this argument. Uh, it, again, it's different things. You know, We use 82 is typically the same thing. Um, but people are driving less, and it's a lot of it is, is this younger generation that are driving less, and it's because they've been raised on their phone is the most important thing to them. When most of us in this room, you know, when we reached 16, getting in the car was, that was it, you know. We hit it, we're made, we're done. Um, my daughter's seven months and she knows how to use my iPhone. Uh, this is what's important to them, you know, is having access to, to these devices. And whether that means, you know, taking a train, taking a bus, um, you know, part of it is because of the recession, people didn't have that car ownership at 16 because that was a, a thing that was cut out of, of a family budget because, uh, you know, from a cost of insurance wise. But the mobile phone is, is the most important thing to uh, a lot of people. Um, obviously, you know, part of this is also the migration to the cities, um, the recession, just the cost. But, but there's a lot of reasons, but, but people are driving less, and this isn't a trend that, that's going away. Um, and, you know, as we, as we, as the baby boomers begin to fade out of the, the working economy and millennials continue to push in, it's going to be even driving less and less. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of what we're going to talk about with transportation, obviously, is, is managing demand and providing more options for people. Um, you know, and it's, whereas transportation for so long was not what, you know, this trend slide would be like, people are driving more, we need to build more highways. That, that was the trend, that was, that was all that was going on in, in transportation, where in particularly the last few years, the, the trends in transportation have been explosive. Um, you know, if you look at a plan 15 years ago, no one thought that I could take my phone, and from my phone, I could pay for my parking, I could rent a car, I could get a car share vehicle, I could know when my bus is coming, I could know when my train is coming. I could, you know, pretty much anything to do with transportation now is on my phone. And that's how I, you know, plan a day around transportation. And you know, as we begin to think about the future and, and where transportation is going to go, it's a hard thing. And, and this, this question that you brought up about energy and water and infrastructure, transportation is a big part of that as well. Um, you know, when you really start to think, you know, I, I get off and asked by architects who don't think that I can think outside of a box, you know, what's the sci-fi thing? You know, you hear about something like self-driving cars. Uh, and, you know, for most of us, it's like that's, that seems crazy. But, you know, people probably thought this was crazy 15 years ago as well. Um, and thinking about, like, the impact of something like that has on, on parking, 
um, and how people get around. Um, you know, but there's just so many shifts, particularly in, in urban areas in New York and Chicago, that are going to eventually come down here as, as the market becomes for, for getting around. Um, <clears throat> and whether it's uh, you know, car sharing, bike sharing, a, a number of different options that, that we'll be looking into to, to figuring out how we provide more options for people getting around. People are still going to drive, and that's obviously going to be part of, of what we're looking at. Um, but giving people those options um, begins to add more flexibility to what everybody's doing up here. Um, and, and you know, bicycling is going to be part of it. Uh, this is bike share in Chicago um, as well as New York. It's 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 not it's a, it's a different uh, method. It's not bike rental. It's basically you pick up a bike and, and go where you want. Um, there's different models for this in different types of cities. You know, to to make it work, and whether it's just through a hotel, through a university, different things. Um, but it's the idea that. Uh, giving a different face to bicycling um, so that everybody's out biking from the 55 year old guy out working to the the family out so you, you see a different face and it's and it creates a better culture on the streets because obviously there's tension and I'm sure there's tension here as we sort of talk between bicyclists pedestrians and, and vehicles and we want to create a culture of respect that's safe for everyone Isn't that fun? I like hearing these guys. They just, they make it seem so interesting. Like, it's a hopeful future, right? Um, we're going to do an exercise in a second. You all have little clickers, but uh, while we're getting that set up, any questions for any of the, the slew of people who spoke in the last couple minutes? Any one quick question, comment? Speechless? Or, yep. We, uh, we showed the map early on, um, you know, if we'll, I don't know where your house is, but probably we'll get pretty close. Um, we, we can come find me afterwards. We'll find your house and we'll answer it. Sir, did you have a question? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Average size where? Uh, I, it, you'd have to give me a location for, it, it depends on where you are, in a very, in a very dense urban place. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I honestly don't know. We, we will do analysis for, for normal, not for average in Chicagoland, which is, I drove down here from Chicago, that's a long way. No, no one has advocated any housing size at all. You may be mistaken that I mentioned micro lofts, and I did say that probably as, as, as soon as never would micro lofts be something that would be required or viable in a place like normal. So I don't think that it's, it's reasonable to have a discussion right now about findings that are at least a month or a month and a half away. <clears throat> Sir, you've raised a lot of issues. Uh, we're not going to solve them now. Uh, I think we're going to move on. Thank you for your comments. Okay, so does everybody have one of the clickers? 
So we're going to do a little exercise. And what we're going to do is show you pictures of Uptown Normal and ask you what you think about it. So, um, but to teach you the technology, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions just to sort of check this out. So you can see there's A through E. So the question is, where would you like to visit one day? A, Hawaii, B, Rio de Janeiro, C, London, D, Egypt, E, um, Australia. So please vote your preference. And we, you'll see how the sort of technology works, we hope. Uh, there's not at all of the above. <laughs> But I share your opinion. It's a, they, also, they were well-chosen lists. Um, OK, so how does this work? OK, done, we're done. So up, oh, what just happened? There we go. So the winner is tied between London and Australia. We like the, the United King, uh, the, what are the Commonwealth, Commonwealth, right? So cool. Favorite TV show? Let's try this again. Big Bang Theory, Walking Dead, Scandal, The Voice, none of the above. I don't own a TV. Um, we can do this as a quick little exercise. But what, what do you know? They're vo voting, they're voting, they're voting. 70. 70 votes. Oh my gosh. Who we got? What's the winner? Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. We have a discriminating audience. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I think we've got we we have the technology. We figured out how to press the buttons and you know tell us where you want to travel and so on. So um, so that was just a test test run. Um, so next we're going to do this with pictures of uptown. And so this is this is a way. Um, let me just sort of give a little setup here. So they're pictures of things that you all see every day. We don't see that often. Um, Uptown has happened incrementally over 15 years, right? So a lot of things were built 10 years ago, and eight years ago, and five years ago, and two years ago, and so on. Um, what we wanted to do was to show it to you dispassionately fresh, right? So you'll see it on the screen. You might walk by the thing every day. Um, but anyway, we'll show it to you again, and we'll just ask you kind of, would you, essentially, did we do this well, or not well, or don't know? Those are, I think it's well, not well, and don't know. So, um, and we don't have a bias to what you say. Everything could be done perfectly well. You could hate all of it, or you could not know any of it. So there is no wrong answer. Um, and ooh. while we're deleting aliases and things like that, are there any questions uh, that I can answer? I guess the gentleman with the housing question has left, it looks like. So can't answer his question. Sir. No, 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 no. So just, just to say, part of our job is to coordinate amongst you know, projects, initiatives, investments. That's no, no. But we take, it is not built yet. And so our opportunity is if there's a, a moment where it can be tweaked to be made better, we think that's a great opportunity. Let me just say about it, you know, it was designed to get people up and over the tracks. I think it had one goal, right? In showing you, in bringing these experts forward and kind of beginning to paint a picture for some of the ideas that are out there, you know, we can see where a bridge like that could actually do multiple things. That's all. So. I, I, not the person to characterize how well cast it is and jello and concrete. Well, I, I'm, I'm of that temperament that if it isn't built yet and if there's an opportunity to make it you know, a little better. Uh, people like to hear that, right? So that's all. I think we're ready. OK, does that make sense? OK, so here we go. So um, dim the lights if we can, if, or if they're dim enough, if people can see. These are, I think, seeing the detail is, is good here. So we're going to ask you, these are all considerations. Whoa. Oh, there we go. Perfect. So these, the titles in the top, oh, it's too dark, OK. We need glow, glow in the dark, right? Or something like that. Uh, ooh, my eyes, my poor eyes. Um, so each of these things, street character, architecture, materials, 
uh, uh, and things like that are aspects of the plan that we're going to build. So we're going to ask you about each of these existing streets. So here's the first one, right? So uh, we'll show you the question. Can we go backwards, by the way, in this if we want to? Just, I'm just going to show people the kind of question they're going to get, and it's going to cover the image. So I want you to kind of study the image, draw a conclusion. This is the same question we're going to ask every time, so let's do it. Ask the question. So is the street character appropriate for the future of normal? Essentially, do you like it, do you not like it, or you don't know? Right? So um, but that's the question. So moving forward, right? Would, should we build, was this street good enough that we should do it again? Because right? we're going to be planning streets and things. Uh, th thank you. Hi, how are you? Um, we certainly can give a definition of street character. So can we get rid of the question for a second? Um, so street character, you know, does it feel good? Would you like to walk on it? Does it add value? Is it delighting you? Is it, you know, uh, rewarding, right? So I guess that's it. Can people still see? I don't know what's with these. There's gremlins in this room here tonight. Um, okay, let's ask the question. Okay. Yes, no, don't know. OK. Keep them coming, keep them coming, keep them coming. OK, good. What do we know? Yes. And what is that, 60, 68%. So um, can I just ask the people who said no? Just a quick phrase, just shout it out. Yes. More consideration of <clears throat> different materials in the building. Okay. Yes, sir. I don't like iron walls. You don't like the I don't, think don't like the high rise. Okay. Can somebody write these down? This is important. Are there any other comments? That was great. Let's do the next one. Street character. You know what's you know what question's coming? I guess we're voting. Okay, how are the votes? Still coming in. Okay. 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 We're we're Slowly coming in. Okay, if you guys can vote a little quicker. A little quicker. Yeah. There we go. Okay. That made a difference. Okay. What do we know? Ooh, about half and half. Um, again, can the nose speak? Yeah. More density, okay. Other comments? Yeah. Okay. Got that. Was there another comment? Yes, yes, ma'am. Angled rather than parallel parking, okay. And that's to get more parking in, or just because it's easier to do, or. Okay, good comment. Any other? Left side is charming, right side is boring and outdated. Write that one down. That man spoke with conviction. I like that. Sir? The storefronts are unattractive. Okay, I think we've, we've got a pretty good sense of this one. Let's move on. Thank you all. Next one, street character. Okay, how are they voting? How are we, we getting there? Coming in, coming in, keep it going, doing great. Attaboy, yeah. All right, we good? Good, last couple. Three, two, one, boom. What do we got? Okay, pretty good street. Um, can the nose say their bit, please? Why, why not? Yeah. 
Okay. So if it was developed, it, that'd be a good thing. Okay. Any other no's care to comment? So parking scarce, decks too complicated. The young lady here, yeah. Okay, it's the comment. I see a lot of signs about it. You know, the drop off at the train station. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll hold the question the longest possible time so people can see the picture. Because once the question appears, it's useless. Thank you. Next one. Rishma, yeah. So we'll give you about a count of 10 to sort of draw a conclusion. And then we'll put the question up and vote quickly. So uh, count of five, four, three, two. One, let's vote. Everyone vote quickly. Yes, no, I don't know. What are you doing? Three, two, one, go. Okay, the no's, what's on your mind? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we filled in a, a ground floor establishment on the right and built a building on the left, we'd, we'd be there? So it's, is it mostly a judgment about it being incomplete? Right. Yeah, okay. Does that summarize most people's impressions of it? Yes. Could I summarize it by saying landscape would help? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's move on to the next one. <clears throat> Street character. That thing in the air. That part of the crane? Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, it looked like a parachuter, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, where is he going? Where is he going? All right, let's uh, draw your conclusions. Let's vote. Street character appropriate. Yes, no, to no. Yes. Yeah. How are we doing? Three, two, one. Boom. Uh, can the nose speak? Is it uh, if it's not about if it's a we get it that it's incomplete and that's unsatisfying? Are there comments beyond its incompleteness? Anything about the design? Yes, somewhere. Oh, sir. Sure. Yeah. Okay. You'd like on street parking for the train? You mean the Amtrak? You mean so someone going into Chicago should park on the street? No, on the train. Dropping off. Okay, sure. Okay. Right. Right. I think the young lady over here made that similar point. So I think we got that one. Other non other unique comments like that? Sir. Okay, urban canyons. So urban canyons, windiness, and so on. 
Um, I'll say those dorms behind our, our incredible wind tunnel. Oh my God, about knocked me over today. Young man, did you have a comment? Okay. 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 So if you didn't hear that, um, the. Children's Discovery Museum has some art on the facade that makes it interesting. This one isn't as interesting, could be better, something like that. How to do? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I think we've got that. Good. All right, next one. <clears throat> okay, three, two, one, let's vote. Would that, should we build another street like this? What's good, what's bad? Well, we... Um, the uh, annex site um, may need some new streets in it to get get around. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> what did we do wrong? Oh my God. Uh, quick comments. What what's wrong? Boring and ugly. What do you really think? <laughs> yep. Um, other comments? Cheap. Cheap? Sir? And then you like the trees? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, the overhead wires. They're just polluting the view of the thing. Okay. Yeah? Others? Sir? No visual appeal. Okay. Others? No retail. Well, it's a residential street. You're, we can beat up on it for lots of things, but to make it something it isn't. Um, yeah, yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we like it because it has no bike lanes. Well, yeah, you guys should hang out because I think you'd have some <laughs> and invite me. I think it'd be a great conversation. Was there a comment back here somewhere? So the street parking was good, was bad, okay. And so where do you, where do you want the cars behind the buildings? Okay, All right. Okay. Any other unique comments, sir or oh, ma'am? Okay. Sort of the scale jump isn't working. Yeah. Are you one of those people? I think you are. I think you're, we're learning about <laughs> you, aren't we? Yeah, that just happened. Okay. All right, uh, let's go to the next one. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. All right, street character. Get, is this good? Not so good? Don't know. Let's vote. Let's be fast. Who, vote your vote your preference. What are we doing? 
Okay. Hmm. Okay. What do we got here? Lacks character. Okay. What else? Sir. The median makes it hard to cross the street. It's pretty treacherous geometry there, isn't it, anyway? Yeah. Yeah. Um, were there, was there a comment over here? No. no it's fine. <laughs> yeah, sir. So the sidewalk's kind of skinny? Okay. Okay, sir? Okay. Is irritating. Yeah. Okay. All right, I think we've got this one, right? Next one. Okay, let's vote this one. Okay, three, two. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, what do we think? Last one? Yeah. Anything, you, anything we didn't say the last time? <laughs> yes? Yeah? Yeah. Right. Oh, okay, yeah, that's good. That's good, yeah, thank you. Okay, yeses, what'd you say? Okay, okay. An honest answer from an honest man. So, other yeses behind you, the young lady. Yeah. You don't care for the look of the gas station. Yeah. Any other yeses care to share their thoughts? Okay. Statistically, we know at least eight of you voted yes. So, oh, come <laughs> on. You know. You know. There's no hiding. Any. Sir, yeah. Lack. lack of landscaping. Were you a yes or a no? No. You were a no. Okay. I guess there's only one person that's fessing up to being a yes. Okay, so we'll leave it to our head scratching moment what, what the yeses were thinking. So, um, all right, let's move on. All right, let's vote this one. E, we think so, yeah. Okay, let's vote this one. Okay, unique comments. This is the first time we've seen a cul-de-sac or a street that didn't go through. Were any of the no's related to that? Yes, ma'am. But the trail causes the streets to be quiet and all that stuff. Yep. yep. Yes, sir. Right. 
I'm Yeah. So you're saying this, uh, if the if this area redeveloped under the design standards, it would be better. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, sir. Vote yes for the. Uh, open. Okay. The the lawn and such. Okay. Good. All right. Can we fast forward to like a? This is really. Keep going. Keep going. You'll just. Everyone will notice these. I think we don't have to say much about that one. We've got. It. We hit the telephone lines. Keep going. Let's get this. This one is an interesting one. We don't have to vote on it, but um, you know, uh, in a downtown, when you have very scarce places, the where you put your transformers and your stuff matters a lot. Obviously, let's go. Keep going, keep going. Um, let's keep. How many of the building materials do we have? Three. Let's let's keep going. This one, let's let's vote this one. This one is an interesting one. I don't have any uh, dog in this fight, but it but this is a case where there's multiple building materials used on the facade. It's one of the things that um, the first uh, plan had design guidelines and said, please use these materials and please don't use these materials. And so this one used a variety of materials. Uh, did this get it right? So let's vote on it. Yes, no, don't know. Okay, how we do it? Okay, yeah, a lot of yeses, so most people. Um, can I ask the no's what was on your mind? Yes, ma'am. Wow, that's a stinger. <laughs> Did you hear that? Everything's going to look like it was built in 2012. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Other, sir. The white concrete is which part? Oh, the bays. Okay. Okay. Good, sir. Concrete block on the first one. Yeah, thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Let's do maybe one, sir. Uh, the question is, have, has anyone ever visited Andersonville in Chicago? And we have, yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's do one more building one. Yeah. Is Go to the next one. That one's. Yeah. Let's let's ask about this one. So, facade treatment is a kind of compound word that basically says the original design guidelines. You may not know asked that new buildings 
simulate or, or respond to the kind of 25 and 50 foot wide lots that the older buildings sit on. So you get that kind of rhythm down a street of sort of smaller facades. This building did that. The question is, did it do it well, right? So it had to do that, but did it do it well? Could it, have, you know, did it, did we get it right? Let's vote it. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, good. Um, can we hear some, from some yeses and from some noes just on this one? Yeses? What do we like about it? It's better than the... Okay. Yeah. Okay. That that's a good sort of summary of comments. Did she sort of capture a lot of the thoughts of what people that voted for it agreed with? How about the the nose? Uh, this is one with only two percent don't have an opinion. So this is a very opinionated one. How about the nose? Yes, ma'am. So did everybody hear that? They did a good job at the bottom, but the top isn't tied in, doesn't relate, right? Right? Did you have a question or a comment? Great. I think this has been a wildly successful exercise. So um, thank you for that. So um, do we want to collect the little handsets or whatever? Um, is that the, so can we have volunteers to scan the floor and collect the handsets? Can we have the lights up? I think we're going to go to some. So what we wanted to do at the end, we've actually been listening quite a, amount, quite a lot, but we wanted to pose a, three questions. While we're waiting, any questions? Any? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this man is totally right. So uh, we sent someone down last week after the leaves were off the trees, and it and it was a. Um, it's a it's a hard time of year to do photography because if you get a sunny day, the shadows are really deep, and you get an overcast day, it's an overcast day. So you kind of there isn't a good good balance. So, um, we're making adjustments. Any other questions or comments while we're... Yeah, that's it. So for the, the last 10 or 10 or 15 minutes of our meeting, we just wanted to ask some really kind of open-ended questions. Um, I think, um, why don't we just focus on the third one? So uh, Mayor Coos introduced this as Uptown 2.0. So it's a, blank, it's a blank piece of paper at this point. Nothing exists, no drawings have been done, no market studies have been done. Um, what what should be in it? What should it include? What are the features? What's the vision? Yes, and can I get a scribe, Steve or Karishma, can I get a scribe to record this? Yes. Grocery store. Does anyone else agree with grocery store? Let the record show that everyone agreed with grocery store. Okay. Um, that was a very good answer. Do we have a second? What's that, what's that show, Family Feud, where if you match a word and the high percent <laughs> grocery store, right? Okay. What? Any others, Mark? Mm. 
non-student residential, okay? Other, a lot of nodding on that one, yeah. Second to the supermarket, okay. This is good if we're gonna just go in descending order, it's so convenient, sir. Grocery store, I'm sorry, yeah, sir. Okay, so a co-op. Find this man afterwards. You have sh shares to sell tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, you are you a share owner? Okay, wow. So he's what's called dispassionate. He doesn't have a stake in it, but you're a citizen advocate. Thank you. I'm, I'm messing with you. Thank you. Um, other, what else should it have, sir? Green space. Okay agreement with green space anyone against that okay we're for that young Okay, so other, what other college towns have? Do you want to take a, somebody want to, we have the panel of experts. I'll, we've got 30 seconds to answer the question. Great to work. Um, <coughs> we'll certainly look into that, and I don't want to jump to any conclusions yet until I learn a little bit more about normal and what it, what it lacks and what it could have. But just a random sampling of ideas in Durham, North Carolina, where, D where Duke is, um, the, the, the downtown was really decrepit, uh, kind of falling apart. Um, and then there were some relationships between a corporation, university, the public sector to redevelop its downtown. There's a brand new performing arts center that's done spectac spectacularly well. You have to be careful with some of those performing arts centers. Sometimes they don't do so well, but that one's done extraordinarily well. Um, I don't think this is potentially right for normal, but there's a baseball stadium in Durham that's incredibly successful. Um, and what's more interesting, though, is that Duke has actually taken up a lot of office space in an old tobacco factory in downtown Durham. And um, there's law firms and tech companies that have kind of been attracted to that new office space. So there's a lot of different ingredients that come to campus towns. The successful college towns that we've seen have uh, downtowns that appeal to young families, college students, the faculty, to senior citizens, that they appeal a little bit to everybody. And there seems to be uh, a benefit to that. The college students are around non-college students. They, they tend to behave a little better. <laughs> and, uh, and you know the seniors and and empty nesters sort of like being around uh, younger people. So I think uh, Charleston, South Carolina, is a really good example of that, where they have the College of Charleston right downtown. And uh, and uh, I think when you pull it off well, when you have businesses and restaurants that appeal, and housing that appeals to all of those age groups, it's good for everybody. And I think Charleston is one of the best in the country. Okay. Yeah. So so I think two parts, generally connections from the south across the tracks and specifically the bike route on Constitution Trail as it currently goes is perceived to be or may be unsafe. Right. So it was a patch but not a, a solution. Sir. Okay, water, yeah. Okay, 
employers in the office. So we haven't heard from you, sir. Wow, good comment, sir. Public art. Do we have any now? Right. Okay, but more public art. Good, sir. Have we seen the mural on the back of the Legion building? I don't know that I have this trip. We'll look for it. Okay, good, ma'am. Alfresco dining, more of that, good. Ma'am? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, plazas. Doing my scan here. Any? We got them all? No. No way. I'm sorry, Mark, sorry. You <laughs> More people, fewer cars. Okay. Uh, um, um, Mr. Newton has asked for you know a hovercraft and no I'm just I'm messing with you now parking at the periphery in a trolley to connect. Um, others, sir. Edible landscape, cool. What do you have, what do you have in mind? You know what people will say, that's nuts. <laughs> no? Okay. It's 8.27. I'm on it. <laughs> Who said it was 8.30? Three minutes. Um, sir. Bike rental. Do we have, there's no bike rental in the downtown? Okay. Okay. Cool. Got a couple minutes left. L any last thoughts, sir? Okay. Outdoor player for kids. Cool. Sure. Public lighting? Sort of nighttime lighting stuff? Okay. Is it dark now? Okay, more interesting. That that's I like let's get that one. More interesting lighting. Cool. Sir. way to keep the trail open later, including better lighting. Okay, cool. Last scan. Any burning ideas? So, excellent meeting. This is the kickoff. 
So we're going to record all this. We will publish the results of the polling uh, and so on. Um, but we pick this up again in either late January or early February. I'm not quite sure if the date's been set. So um, what we'll come back and do is schedule, a, is it a couple, two or three day uh, workshop. We'll have, everyone will be invited back. I hope you all come. It was kind of fun, right? Kind of fun. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I hope that you learn from the experts behind me because they're pretty smart people. Um, and anyway, we'll come back and we're going to work together and make a great Uptown 2.0 plan. So uh, to Mark, Mercy, the mayor, council, any, did I forget anything, Wayne, any, anything I forgot to cover? Um, team, anything we forgot to cover? All right. So on behalf of our consultant team, thank you very much for being a, s a really fun group. And uh, we'll mingle for a few minutes if you have any more questions. Anyway, thanks for, thanks for coming. It's 8.30. We're done. Good night. <laughs>